Good morning. <laughs> My name is Catrice Nakamura, and I'm the Executive Director over Critical Care Services and the Neuroscience Institute for Providence. I will be your moderator for today's event. So thank you for joining us. And I'm going to go off script a little bit to say this has been a long time in planning. You know, we had looked forward to doing this back in, we started planning 2019, 2020, and then we all know it happened. Um, shortly thereafter when we were getting ready to, to do this. And it's so wonderful to look out and see everybody here this morning. So welcome, welcome. Um, I'm very excited for this. So thank you for joining us at the beautiful Palos Verdes Golf Club for our lecture focusing on movement disorders. I hope everyone enjoyed our resource fair and was able to get some valuable information. We're joined today by five neuro experts to discuss the latest advancement in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease. But before we get started, I wanna let everyone know that this will be a two hour presentation. We've scheduled a 15 minute break beginning at 10.55 in between um, two sets of our presentations. We will not be able to open the floor to questions today, but instead we've have provided a question card for all of you, so you should have had those at each of your seats. Um, please note any questions you may have on the card, and we will collect them from you at the break. Um, we've scheduled time at the end of our presentations to collect the rest of the question cards, um, and at that time we will do our Q&A with our physician and our neuro expert panel please feel free to write multiple questions on the cards. So next, I wanna share a little bit about Providence Little Company of Mary's Neuroscience Institute. The Neuroscience Institute for Providence Little Company of Mary's Comprehensive Stroke Program was recently recognized as the busiest stroke center with the highest quality outcomes for rapid recognition and treatment of stroke across all of Los Angeles County. Additionally, the Neuroscience Institute for Providence has grown and now provides comprehensive neuroservices. These services include our robust movement disorder program, our brain tumor care, our neuro and spine surgery program, our ears, nose, and throat program, facial pain center, brain health center, as well as our neuroscience research program. All of this in partnership with our providers at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. You will find a comprehensive list of neuroscience services in the gift bags that we provided for you at your seats. Lastly, I want our attendees to know that the information provided during this program is for educational purposes only. You should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or treatment. And finally, just a little reminder, and I'll do it myself, please remember to silence your cell phones. Um, let's see. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of this session, um, Dr. Natalie Diaz. Dr. Natalie Diaz is a board certified neurologist with fellowship training in movement disorders. Her clinical practice focuses on the evaluation and management of patients with Parkinson's disease, atypical Parkinsonian disorders, Huntington's disease, and other choriform disorders, dystonia, and ataxia. She also has specialized training in the evaluation and programming of deep brain stimulation as a treatment of Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia, as well as a therapeutic administration of botulism toxin injections for non-cosmetic indications, such as focal dystonia, hemifacial spasm, and limb spasticity. Her research focuses on industry-sponsored clinical trials in Parkinson's disease and other collaborative clinical projects in the field of neurodegenerative disorders. So welcome, Dr. Diaz. Great, thank you so much. Everybody can hear me? Yeah. It'll be a little bit too loud. So I wanna thank everybody for coming out here today. What a great day, what a beautiful setting. A lot of faces that I recognize, some that I don't, but hope to meet. Um, I wanna start off first by thanking Providence Little Company of Mary 
for putting on this event um, and all the sponsors that came today to help us put this on and support us. As somebody who has practiced in this community for nearly 20 years, and somebody who lives in this community, I live just up the hill, so not too far from here. It took me seven minutes to get here. I'm excited that we have subspecialty services that are growing in this community so that people don't have to travel, get on the 405, get on the 110 to go places. So I am going to start off today's lectures with a little bit of an overview of the two most common conditions that we see in our clinic, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. So let's start off with Parkinson's disease. So this is the bulk of what we see in our clinics. Um, the last estimates, there's nearly a million people in this country that are suffering and living with Parkinson's disease, 10 million people worldwide, 90,000 new people diagnosed with Parkinson's in this country every year. So as this diagram up there on the top shows, that's enough to fill the Rose Bowl every year. And this number is growing. It's really exploding the number of people in the worldwide that are getting diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So if you have trouble getting in to see me or any moving disorder clinic around the city and around the country, it is because where the number of specialists isn't keeping up with the number of people that are getting diagnosed and all the programs are trying to grow to meet that demand. This is a condition that spares no corner of the country Every country has Parkinson's disease. Every ethnicity has Parkinson's disease. People of Caucasian and Hispanic descent tend to have a little bit of a higher risk. We diagnose Parkinson's in the 90s, and unfortunately, sometimes about 10% of people under the age of 40 also get diagnosed. Men have a slightly higher risk than women, about one and a half times the risk. So. You know, we think of Parkinson's disease as a chronic condition. It is progressive, very slowly progressive over decades. And what we think is happening in the brain is there are certain cell groups that make dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine. They age faster than the rest of the brain. They go through stress. And because of that, we get uh, a deficiency in some of these chemicals. What causes Parkinson's disease? We're still not sure. In a small percentage of patients, genetics plays a key role. It can be passed on to generation uh, to generation, but that only accounts for about 5% of people. Most people, we think that Parkinson's comes about from a combination of something in the genetic code that puts people at risk, the wear and tear of our natural aging and, and brain aging, and then something that could we come across in our lifetime. And it can be different for different people, a virus, trauma to our head, some chemical that we breathe, we eat, we're exposed to. And it's the combination of these things, we think, that come together and start off the cascade. And it may be that, and what we're learning, is that this group of collection of, of risks can vary and be different from person to person. Where Parkinson starts, that's another point of controversy. Most researchers, myself include, included believe that Parkinson's probably starts outside of our nervous system, outside of our central nervous system, in the little nerve endings either of our nose or of the gut. Um, there is accumulating evidence that people have a lot of issues with the gut in Parkinson's disease. There is a direct communication between our intestine and the brain, what we call the gut-brain access. The normal bacteria and flora um, in, our, in our intestine, what we call the microbiome, is responsible for keeping the communication in a healthy way. And if people have a change in their microbiome, bad bacteria overpower the good bacteria, it releases inflammatory chemicals and toxic chemicals in our gut, causes inflammation in the lining in our gut, and causes what we call leaky gut. And we think that some of that that's happening, that inflammation in our gut, may send signals up to the brain and some of these inflammatory signals in the brain. Now, we know that a lot of people with Parkinson's have a lot of intestinal issues very early in this condition. And a lot of patients have been shown to have this imbalance in their gut bacteria. But we don't recommend people take antibiotics for it. And we usually discourage people from spending a lot of money on probiotics because with a lot of, like a lot of the supplement industry, you don't know what you're getting in these bottles. It's not well regulated. 
So it's better to work with a gastroenterologist if you have a lot of gastrointestinal issues. If you're working with a naturopath that sources and knows what you're getting. But otherwise, we recommend that people try to stick to a very healthy diet um, and help flourish that good bacteria in your, in your intestine naturally. So how do we recognize Parkinson's? Well, we have four classic or cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's. About 75% of people get tremor, tremor in the arms, tremor in the legs, the lower jaw, the, the, the lips tends to happen when you're completely at rest and usually when you go to move, that tremor gets better or goes away. There's muscular stiffness, that what we call rigidity. There's slowness of movement, what we call bradykinesia. And there are changes in the walk and the posture and balance. And it manifests in a very clear way. There can be blunting of facial expression. There can be loss of voice volume and hoarseness. There can be um, Handwriting gets small and movements get small. Turning in bed can be difficult. Getting up out of a chair, people can take smaller steps, what we call baby steps. Posture can become stumped, uh, stooped or hunched over. Um, people can have problems with balance. So these are the physical manifestations of Parkinson's disease that we look for to help make our diagnosis. But we know that there can be a lot more to Parkinson's than just what we see. There's a collection of symptoms that we call the non-motor symptoms that a lot of people with Parkinson's can suffer with. Things like problems with concentration and attention, problems with lack of energy and feeling sleepy during the day, losing motivation, what we call apathy, maybe having um, changes in their sleep, acting out their dreams, having vivid dreams constipation, urinary problems, low blood pressure, uh, loss of smell, um, sexual dysfunction. This is all part of Parkinson's disease and sometimes can predate the other symptoms by many years. But it's always very important when you're reading about Parkinson's and you read all these symptoms, not everything is going to pertain to you, right? So everybody with Parkinson's is different. Some people have tremors, some don't. Some people have constipation, some don't. Some have memory problems, some don't. So never compare yourself to other people. This is a very individual condition. Okay, so how do we treat Parkinson's once we make that diagnosis? And I'm not gonna get too into the nitty gritty because how we treat, when we treat, what we treat with, how we change the medication is very individual. We look at a person's age, what their main symptom is, what the severity of the symptom is, how it impacts their life, what other medications there are, what other comorbid issues they have to help guide us with what we're going to do. But what we have is a, an arsenal of medications these days that we can use. There's levodopa, which is our classic medication helps your brain make more dopamine and we have that comes in a variety of different formulations immediate release controlled release extended release dissolvable forms and inhalable forms uh, infusions into the intestine we also have medications that prolong the life of levodopa if it starts to wear out too early between the doses we have synthetic forms of dopamine, what we call the dopamine agonists. They're not as potent as levodopa, but can sometimes um, prevent us from using levodopa too early, or if somebody has tremor, they may be better. And then we have a variety of chemicals that work on other brain chemicals. If somebody has a lot of tremor or has dyskinesias, like the movements like Michael J. Fox, um, or the medication's not lasting a lot. So we, we use these medications in different ways for different people. Um, looking at everybody individually and see how best to make them move better, okay? So besides medications, we do a lot of, anybody who, who follows with me knows that I do a lot of nagging about lifestyle, healthy, staying healthy, eating well, exercising, trying to get good sleep, and all the research points us into the direction that this is very important in Parkinson's and actually helps people stabilize. So, you know, all the research shows that people that have been active all their lives have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's 
and if you develop Parkinson's, trying to stay active and live a healthy lifestyle helps stabilize the medication and helps stabilize it, you know, and, and slow this down. Um, so that's an easy thing that people can do. And we usually recommend that people try to find ways to, even if you can do 20 minutes a day and change it up, do something that's cardiovascular, gets your heart rate, do something that helps you build muscle and bone, strength training, resistance bands, weights, do something that helps you build core body strength, which is good for balance and posture, as well as do something cognitive that's shown to be good for um, memory and thinking, something that is strategy building, ping pong, golf, dance, um, boxing, you know, so try to incorporate all of those and have fun. That's very important. In terms of diet, there's no one diet that we recommend for Parkinson's, but all the research shows us that um, anything that's good for the heart tends to be good for the brain. So Mediterranean style diet or something that we call the mind diet, which is similar to Mediterranean, less red meat, less processed food, more whole foods, more plant-based, more fruits, more vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, all that seems to show that it's good for our cardiovascular system and is good for our brain, both memory as well as physical. So those are things that we ask people. I don't say revamp your diet, but every day look to see how can I add more vegetables? How can I add more fruit? How can I maybe take out a little bit of the red meat out of my diet? So lastly, sleep is very important. We know that sleep is not a passive process just to gain rest. Your body is actually active during this time. It's getting rid of toxic chemicals. It's getting rid of toxic proteins. It's rebuilding good proteins and rebuilding chemicals in your brain. So getting to sleep at a good time and trying to get good sleep is very important. Okay, so now I'm gonna pivot and I'm gonna talk about the second most common thing that we see in our clinic, which is essential tremor. It's actually the most, um, uh, the most prevalent movement disorder, essential tremor, but not everybody seeks doctor's attention. So this is different from Parkinson's. This is mainly a tremor disorder. It is different tremor than Parkinson's. This type of tremor is comes out in motion when people are in the middle of activity. So trying to eat, people will have tremor, trying to drink, trying to write, trying to put on makeup, trying to put on clothing. And many times the tremor can, for some people, get bad enough that it interferes with those activities. Um, it tends to progress slowly over time. People will learn that a little bit of alcohol usually helps their tremor, so a glass of wine or a cocktail. I, I don't promote that as a form of treatment, but most people will, will find that out. And unlike Parkinson's, there's a strong genetic component. So a lot of people can tell me that they've got multiple family members with this condition. Um, now, it tends to be mostly a tremor in the hands, but people can get a little bit of tremor in the head, sometimes with a little bit of a head tilt. They can get a voice tremor. If anybody here remembers Katherine Hepburn, Hers was to the extreme, but she had essential tremor. Um, it rarely affects the legs. And some people can spill over into the rest component of tremor or have a little bit of walking difficulty. So most of the time we can distinguish the two, but occasionally we'll have somebody that confuses us. Are we looking at Parkinson's or are we looking at essential tremor? On a rare occasion, I have people that have both, have had tremor all their lives, but then as they get older, they develop Parkinson's. So how do we distinguish these two? Well, we start in the clinic and we have people do some tests. In your packets you will find on one of the letters is a test that you can do if you have tremor. So in the clinic we start with having people do some of these activities. We'll have them write. We'll have them draw a spiral, try to stay on the line of that spiral. Um, have them drink for us. So we have them do the activities and see. Um, as you can see on the picture there, all the way on your left, somebody who has bad essential tremor, that tremor will come out when they're writing. Um, they'll come out when they're trying to draw the spiral. And if somebody has bad Parkinson's, they may have a little bit of that, but they tend to do everything on a smaller scale. The, the, the spiral may be small, the handwriting may be smaller, and sometimes that helps us distinguish. When we're confused and we can't tell the difference between the two, we have some tests that are available. There is something that's called a SPEC scan or a DAT scan. 
It's available at Little Company. This is a type of brain scan that you get an injection. It tags those cells that make dopamine. And in somebody that has Parkinson's, they'll have a low number, as you'll see on the one on your right. Um, whereas if somebody has essential tremor or doesn't have anything or doesn't have Parkinson's, it should be a normal. So this is one of the tests we can send people for to distinguish. The other thing that is more recent is a skin biopsy. People with Parkinson's have a buildup of proteins in their nervous system, and now we know that you can find it in the little nerve endings of the skin. So we do this in clinic, and we take a little piece of skin in three different places, shoulder and two in the leg, and we look for those little proteins. And so somebody that has Parkinson's will have those, and somebody who has essential tremor will not. So once we make the diagnosis of essential tremor, we have a few medications that are available. There is propanolol, an old blood pressure medication. It's still our first line, can be effective for a lot of people, but if you have a tendency to low blood pressure or low heart um, rate, then not a good one for you. Um, sometimes people are on alternatives for their heart, and so those are acceptable. There's primidone, our second um, first line agent, um, but if you're on blood thinners, not one that you can be on. We have two other ones, Topamax or Topiramate, Gabapentin or Neurontin that are second-lined tremor agents. And if somebody has a good head tremor, we can use injections of Botox-like substances. They're muscle relaxers, and they help relax the muscles of the neck so that people don't have this sort of tremor. We unfortunately can't we don't really use them in the hand because as muscle relaxers, we end up and you know causing muscle hand weakness and sometimes not getting rid of the tremor effectively. But these are the medications that we use. Unfortunately, sometimes if people have a lot of tremor, these medications just take the edge off. They're good if you have mild, maybe moderate tremor, but if you have moderate to severe tremor, sometimes these medications are just not enough. And a lot of it is because we just don't understand where tremor comes from. We do have a variety of wearable devices. And if you go to the Essential Tremor Foundation, they have a listing of wrist-worn devices. They have um, you know, different types of clothing, magnetic, Velcro. There's software you can put on your phone and your computers. Um, there's weighted utensils and weights that you can put on pens, You know, things that can help dampen down the tremor. That's the EssentialTremorFoundation.org. Okay, so I'm going to move on. So what happens when medications don't cut down the tremor? What happens if I have Parkinson's for a few years, but the medications start wearing out? What can I do? Well, we have two advanced therapies that are available. Um, there's deep brain stimulation, who our neurosurgeon, Dr. Langevin, will talk a little bit more. But this has been around for 20 years, more than 20 years. These are implanted. It is a surgery, and people have a little pacemaker under the skin, delivers brain signals that help control the symptoms of tremor and Parkinson's disease. And who is a good candidate? Somebody who has significant tremor and medications just aren't cutting it. Somebody who has Parkinson's disease for a few years, so we're clear on the diagnosis, we're clear the medications help, because if the medications don't help, surgery is not going to help. So we're clear that the medications help, but they're not lasting long enough or they're causing toxicity. Um, and that's who is a good candidate for surgery. The advantages of this surgery is can be very effective. We have more than 20 years experience with this surgery, and we know that people can have good effect of these for a long time. We also know that it's you can do both sides at the same time. Like medicine, we can adjust it over time. People get a phone so they can adjust it and we adjust it in clinic. Um, and it can be a very effective therapy for a lot of people. I'm not gonna go too much into this because I'm running out of time, but over the last five years, we've had an explosion in the technology of DBS. So we have three companies and I think some of them are out here today we are able to remotely program people from home. We are able to, with um, vision into their brain, pick up brain signals, pick up where their electrodes are and model it from a tablet. We're able to listen and record the signals of their brain 
and help us target where we're going to program and see how people respond to their therapy. It's really amazing. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is focused ultrasound. We don't have this in the community yet, but we're hoping um, to try to bring this to Providence in, in the near future. But this is the newest surgical technology where they use ultrasound waves, very focused at high intensity through the skull to warm up these areas of the brain, same areas of the brain that we do deep brain stimulation and create a little lesion. Okay, so the advantages of this therapy that is approved both for essential tremor, Parkinson's tremor, and Parkinson's disease is that one, it's not a surgery, so there's no incision, there's no overnight stay, there's no anesthesia, um, can be very effective, uh, but it's, you know, some of the disadvantages we still have is that there can be some side effects. Usually they're temporary and they go away after a few weeks or a few months. At this point, it's still a staged procedure. So if we're going to do both, we have to do one side, wait nine months, and do the other side, whereas DBS we can do right away. And it looks like a very promising technology, but we're still in the early phase. You know, we have 25 years nearly of DBS um, safety and efficacy data. The focused ultrasound is really only, you know, seven or eight years out. So we still don't, still don't know the longevity of this therapy. But for some people, it's been a very effective therapy. They can't go through surgery, don't want surgery. It's another option. Now, we're going to be having a gala in November. If anybody's interested, we're, we're trying to raise funds to try to bring this technology to the community. And we're hoping that as we learn more about this technology, we'll have it here available at Little Company. OK, so my last slide. Where are we going with Parkinson's? I can't tell you as a researcher how much money is being spent in trying to understand and treat these conditions. We're trying to understand the genetics. We're trying to understand personal risk factors. We're trying to understand why we age, how we age, and how we can intervene. And we really need people to be part of this. And if you speak to the Parkinson's Foundation here or the American Parkinson's Disease Association, there are levels that people can get involved. It sometimes can be as easy as a questionnaire, donating some blood for genetics, donating a swab of saliva or your skin helps us understand more what's happening in Parkinson's. There is an incredible amount of research going in to try to understand you know, this and how to best treat it. Obviously, our goal is a cure or something to arrest this, but there's also a lot of money trying to find new and better therapies for, our, for, for these symptoms. And lastly, the technology that I talked to you about is moving at an incredible pace. So hopefully, all of these technologies and medicines are going to be more personalized so that as we learn what's happening in each individual person, it's not just a blanket of medications that everybody uses, but we can pick and choose which one each person would be more effective with. Okay. And that's our team. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Diaz. Thank you for that interesting presentation. Thank you for sharing the um, up and coming advanced therapies. Um, exciting stuff in the future. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Jean-Philippe Langevin. Dr. Langevin is a board certified and fellowship trained neurosurgeon specializing, specializing in the surgical treatment of movement disorders, epilepsy, and psychiatric conditions. He has extensive experience using neuromodulation to treat conditions such as Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, dystonia, epilepsy, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He employs a variety of treatment modalities, including deep brain stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, and interstitial laser ablation. He is the director of restorative neurosurgery and deep brain stimulation program at the Pacific Movement Disorder Center located at Providence St. John's Health Center and Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center in Torrance. As the Director of Neurospine Surgery and the Spine Institute at Little Company of Mary, Dr. Langevin sees patients with a wide array of disorders. Welcome, Dr. Langevin.
Uh, thanks, Catrice. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to repeat like the uh, 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 intro for Dr. Diaz, but uh, at the same time, I want to make sure I thank everybody for being here, including our sponsor and the foundation, and for Providence to help putting the event together. Uh, I want to say it's been about seven years, I believe, that we started the program. Um, at the time, uh, we did go to the community events put up by the uh, Foundation of Parkinson's Disease, and we were asking people uh, what would make a difference, you know, what's sort of like missing uh, in their treatment of movement disorder. And I want to say one thing that came up like over and over is people wanted to have proximity of care, like community care. Uh, it made sense to me, you know, you have like a movement disorder, it's already hard enough to get around. Uh, so if you have to travel a long distance, uh, you know, it's, it's, dif it's difficult. And also if you're undergoing something more invasive like surgery, you know, then it leads people to be a little bit uh, fearful because, you know, if there was, God forbid, a problem or an issue, like your physician might be uh, far away to reach. So our vision at the time was to establish um, state-of-the-art care locally in the community. Uh, and so in, in partnering up with Tolka uh, Pinemeri, things have been amazing, uh, very supportive. And so it's, it's great to see uh, that, that it might be impactful and make a difference for the community. Um, and so as Catrice was saying, uh, my role is uh, as the neurosurgeon. Uh, I provide uh, surgical treatment uh, when a medication might not be enough, both for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. So in other words, uh, Dr. Diaz makes the diagnosis, you know, if it hasn't been established yet by the primary care provider and she uh, does all the treatment uh, with medication and sometimes uh, adjuvant Botox and additional uh, therapies. And when we feel like perhaps uh, surgery might be helpful to treat some of the symptoms and help out in the treatment, that's when patients get referred to me. Uh, and then we discuss, you know, the pros and cons basically. Very good. So my, uh, the objective that I have today, just want to introduce the uh, uh, notion of DBS so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, but basically what I want to spend time is to uh, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of some advances. Uh, so some of the technology improvements that we've seen over the last, uh, I want to say five to 10 years in our industry. Uh, and also I wanted to explain how we do the surgery at the Company of Mary. So it's sort of like demystifying it if somebody was considering it or if they had questions uh, about the procedure. Uh, so what is DBS? So this diagram sort of shows the uh, conceptual framework. Uh, what we do is we stimulate a very precise area inside the brain. So like the amount of electricity that we deliver is basically about two to three millimeters around the tip of an electrode. And the electrode is the size of a spaghetti noodle. Uh, so we insert it in a very precise location uh, based on the diagnosis and based on the main symptoms that are bothering the patient. And uh, that uh, implanted electrode is then connected, as Dr. Diaz mentioned, to a pacemaker or pulse generator located usually under the uh, collarbone. Uh, and the uh, entire system is internal. So a lot of people are concerned, you know, is there anything visible or am I gonna have electrodes or wires sticking out? So everything is hidden under the skin. Um, and it communicates wirelessly. Uh, you can see here a tablet uh, where the physician and also the patients have some capabilities to shape um, the amount of electricity that's being delivered and to shape the, the, the field of electricity that's being delivered. Uh, there are three companies uh, currently in the United States that are FDA approved and commercially available. Uh, and and uh, some of them are at the front uh, uh, here. But uh, the nice thing is that having three competitors, it's really pushed the companies to try to, uh, you know, like up like each other. So there's a little bit of competition in the field and we've seen a lot of advancement in the, um, in the technology as a result of that. Uh, but essentially, the role here of the slides is, is, is to show that uh, the interface uh, that the patient and the physician have is pretty intuitive, and it's, it's, it's basically like the cell phone technology that's been brought into the medical field. So like one company is using Apple, another one Samsung, and another one the Microsoft Surface uh, technology. Uh, so you can see again, so here the implantable system is on the far right where you see the pulse generators. 
uh, then the smaller uh, phone, essentially in this case, it's an iPhone uh, that's uh, get provided to the patient. And so the application communicates with the, uh, with the device. Uh, that uh, interface allows the patient to interrogate the battery. So you know uh, how much energy there is left. Is the therapy on and off? Is it functioning properly? Um, and under certain condition, the physician can unlock programs that allows the patient to make some self-adjustment to the therapy. So you can go up, you can go down. Uh, the physician has a larger tablet, like in this case, it's the Apple uh, iPad. It essentially does the same thing, but as you can imagine, the functionality or, um, are, you know, there's greater functionality to the tablet where there's more, more uh, freedom to increase and modulate the amount of stimulation. Uh, so that's the third example. So, so the nice thing is that it's very intuitive. So when I started in the field, uh, you know, a, a number of years ago, it used to be, and some patients here might, might remember, it used to be like a small uh, patient programmer device that was provided. And the physician had also something looking like really old, like a, uh, the ancestor of a Palm Pilot. And, and it was very, it's not very, uh, you know, user friendly. So you had to know like all the menus and how to get from like one step to the other. So it's nice that there's been a lot of improvement now and, uh, you, you know, merger basically with uh, the industry on the technology to bring an interface that's very intuitive and very easy to understand. Uh, and so some of the uh, advantages, aside from just the uh, user interface, it's been pretty significant. Uh, so I listed some of them here. Um, uh, one of them is that we've seen the advent of rechargeable devices, uh, honestly, over the last 10 years. Um, the rechargeable devices are thinner, so like there's less profile under the chest. Uh, and also somebody who does a lot of sports, for example, so it, it's less uh, encumbrance. Um, and you don't need as many surgeries, you know, so like uh, when we replace a non-rechargeable device, uh, the battery expires in about four or five years. I mean, uh, not expire, but gets depleted. So it needs to be switched. Uh, with the rechargeable, you're looking at 15 years plus, um, and we're expecting that that's going to continue improving. Um, another important advance is uh, the MRI clearance. Uh, so it used to be that once you had one of those implantable device, uh, you couldn't get MRIs anymore, uh, and that poses a problem for uh, a lot of patients. You know, sometimes you may have an arthritic condition that needs to be followed over time, whether it's back pain, uh, knee pain, hip pain. All of those uh, usually require some MRI imaging. Uh, if you have like a benign tumor where, you know, we're, we're following the growth, so those also requires MRI. So that used to be a problem. Uh, but all three vendors now have obtained clearance. Uh, so it still requires that either the patient or the representative of the company places the um, device in an MRI mode, which is basically shutting down the system. Uh, but uh, at least, you know, you're able to get the MRI safely done. Um, I'll go over uh, directional current uh, on, a, on the next slide because uh, it's nice to see the diagram. Uh, but it basically allows us to modulate that electrical field to a smaller, more precise spots around the electrode. Uh, so that maximizes the therapy and reduces the amount of side effect. Um, remote programming has been introduced by one of the vendor, Abbott. Uh, so that's nice for people, for example, where you, know, you might live uh, in a rural area. Uh, so you're coming in uh, to get your surgery uh, to like the main hub, uh, but then you're you know, you're, you're living several hours away. So it used to be that you have to come in for programming. So now it can be done remotely. Uh, and especially with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of us have like started to use uh, Zoom to communicate with our patients. So like the, the patients have uh, been highly responsive to that and a lot of people are interested. So that's uh, something that's available. And we're starting to also to see a wearable emerging uh, with, uh, especially with another vendor with Medtronic and I have a few slides to show what that means for, for the patients. Um, the rechargeable system, uh, what it means, uh, most of you probably have seen like those discs, you know, that are used to wirelessly charge a cell phone or, you know, if you're in a Tesla, you can just put your cell phone on one spot and it charges wirelessly. Uh, same concept with those batteries. So you, the disc is that white piece that you see there. Um, different vendors have like different iteration of it. 
Uh, usually, uh, it's a system where you press the on switch on that white piece, and then it beeps, uh, and it stops beeping once you're like over the device and it couples with it. So that's how you know that it's charging. Uh, and you have the interface on the patient programmer that tells you uh, how much battery charge you have, like how much more time you need to charge it. Um, typically, we recommend uh, for patients once the battery is implanted to charge it every day, but that's mostly to get used to that interface and to kind of get into the routine of doing it. When it's all said and done, most people are going to need to charge it maybe twice a week for about 20 minutes. So, you know, typically you're watching TV in the evening and charging your battery. Uh, and I listed here some of the advantages. Uh, we went over that, right? So it's thinner, uh, it's easier. So somebody who is very uh, active, for example, so that uh, a, a good, um, it's a high advantage. And obviously it lasts 15 years. So if you're at higher risk for uh, surgery um, or obviously you just don't want to have surgery every five years, then that's a good option. Uh, some of the inconvenience, you need to remember to charge it. So uh, you're kind of still tethered in a way to the therapy, right? So it's in the back of your mind that you need to have that charger. Uh, so if you're planning this, you know, trip overseas, maybe for like three, four weeks, you need to have your charger with you, um, the adapter for the, the electrical outlets. Um, and we've seen on occasion uh, with some battery where, where it's a little bit finicky, uh, if the battery is implanted a little too deep or uh, if the battery that's implanted flips on uh, occasion, the battery can stop coupling. So that may require, you know, another surgery or procedures to like unflip it or uh, reposition it in a way that it can be charged. So it's not a perfect technology. We're, we're expecting that in the future, uh, you know, that's something that's probably going to improve. Like my, my dream would be that you have the charger by your nightstand and then automatically as you're sleeping at night, it couples and charges, but we're, we're not there yet. Uh, directional current um, that I mentioned earlier. So that relates to the shape of the electrodes that are implanted uh, in the brain. So the traditional one is shown here at the top. Uh, the part that's important is those four uh, rings uh, made of metal. Uh, the traditional uh, version of it is a circular full ring uh, for the four of them, which allows the provider to shape um, like an electrical field around each of the electrodes or a combination of those electrodes. So you get like a soccer ball or a football type of ball elongated. With the segmented one, uh, so you have like those four uh, black rings. And you see the two in the middles are the ones that are broken into three subunits. So it's not a full ring. So they're like small subunits. Uh, and so that allows here, you can see the electrodes, right? And they're implanted inside the uh, brain. And uh, on the right side of my image there on the top, you can see a regular soccer ball type of electrical field that would be there uh, usually. And you can kind of make out this shape of the uh, electro, the electrical field, and then superimpose to the brain anatomy right in the back where it's kind of encroaching on two different areas of the brain in this case. And so what that does is that it limits the amount of energy that we can deliver to the hot spot inside the brain. So obviously surgically, we aim to place it like right in the center where it needs to go. Uh, but, you know, there's still surrounding areas that limits how much energy we can deliver. So that's when people may have some side effects like tingling, uh, pins and needles sensation, or like facial pulling. So then we have to reduce the amount of energy to avoid those side effects. So with those newer electrodes, what we get is the bottom slide, uh, bottom image, where instead of having like a, a soccer ball, you know, a perfect ring, it's pushed over to one side. So obviously we can, we can uh, determine which side it's going to. So one side of the electrode is not seeing any electricity. That does two things. It, it allows us to deliver more intensity to the hot spot where it needs to go. So the symptoms are better controlled uh, with less side effect. And it also limits the amount of energy that we have to use to generate the same benefit. So the battery lasts longer in the case where you have a non-rechargeable one. Uh, so all three vendors now have the same um, uh, electrical uh, uh, scheme. Uh, uh, so that's that's been a good improvement. 
we think that in the future, what's going to happen is those subunits are going to become even smaller. So like we're going to, instead of having like, say, you know, six subunits, we'll probably have like 15 or 20 where we can shape uh, exactly to the size of the nucleus or the area of the brain. Uh, wearable technology, so I just have a few slides on that. I think it's something that's really exciting for patients, uh, especially if you like to track, you know, a lot of people uh, like to track their daily activities, right? So either uh, for sports, um, like how many steps you've done. Some people like to monitor how much sleeps you have, you know, so like mental health as well. Uh, so that uh, technology is now coming into the medical realm, uh, as you may imagine. Uh, one company called Strife PD, uh, Rune Lab, actually, they made a, an application uh, on the uh, Apple Watch that's made especially for Parkinson disease that you can download. And what it does is that it tracks uh, tremor, uh, dyskinesia. Uh, you can use your um, uh, iWatch to like place uh, when you're having when you're taking your medications, for example. Uh, and, and it generates on the right hand side there like a sort of a monthly uh, average. So when you're having more symptoms throughout the day, when you're taking your medications. And so that can be used for the patients to kind of track how they're doing, uh, but also for the physicians to see, uh, you know, what uh, potential strategy could be used to adjust meds, you know. So you tend to have more, let's say, problems in the morning. So perhaps there's some medication that can be used at certain times. Um, uh, to adjust and reduce those symptoms. Uh, if you do have uh, DBS, then there's an additional uh, uh, column that gets added with the uh, brain activity that's being monitored in addition to that. So we can then modulate like how much DBS you're getting and how that's affecting your symptoms as well. Uh, so that's, that's what it shows here. Basically the um, you can use the Apple iWatch, you know, just by itself to monitor your symptoms. Uh, you can use it as a diary to, so that you don't forget when you see your doctor, like, okay, uh, this is when I'm having problems, this is when I'm having symptoms. So you can enter it that on the fly and then it gets recorded into a monthly report. Uh, and then when you have the uh, DBS inserted, the, the uh, neural activity also gets added on top of, of that as an additional layer. Uh, and so this is a diagram just to show what, what we think in the future, you know, that could be used. Basically, you're at home, uh, you're taking your medications, uh, you're wearing the uh, Apple Watch, you may or may not have the DBS. Uh, you're entering your information as you go. So when you go see your physicians uh, every two to three months or so for adjustment, uh, the visit is like uh, perhaps shorter. Uh, but it's it's not as stressful to remember everything that has happened. Like your physician is eventually going to get uh, a report of everything that happened. Uh, if you input it the diary notes, it's going to be in, uh, recorded there. So you have a more comprehensive view of what happened uh, over the past like two to three months, as opposed to like maybe what you remember, you know, from the past few days. Uh, I'm probably going to need help to run those videos because I don't think I can click to activate them. Uh, basically, it's just to show what happens, you know, after a DBS. Uh, so on the a, on a left-hand side, it's a, a pre-op video of, of a patient who's having a lot of like freezing, uh, a lot of rigidity, I should say, uh, getting out of the car to ambulate. Um, and the same patient uh, undergoes surgery. And then you can see on the, if we click on the right hand side, uh, any improvement in fluidity of movement. So like the, basically DBS improves all the uh, uh, cardinal symptoms that Dr. Diaz mentioned. Uh, so the, the tremor, uh, the rigidity, uh, the bradykinesia, the slowness of movement, dyskinesia. So those symptoms are all improved uh, with DBS. Uh, so who should consider uh, DBS, you know, who it might be helpful for? Uh, so usually we like to have patients who had a uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's for about three to five years. The main reason there is uh, to confirm that it's truly the diagnosis uh, so that everybody's comfortable that we're not treating a mimicker of, uh, of Parkinson's disease. Uh, typically, it's better when the symptoms are mild to moderate. Uh, so if, if someone was to wait too long, um, uh, the benefits are, are mitigated. So the benefits are like still about the same, uh, but they're not gonna, the quality 
of life improvement is not going to be as great. So since the risk of the surgery are on change, you're, you're still taking a, a significant amount of risk and your quality of life is not going to be uh, that impacted, right? So as someone is uh, um, in a stage where you're in a wheelchair or inside an institution, uh, that time, you know, it's very unlikely that the surgery would permit that patient from getting back uh, in an independent uh, style of living uh, and being able to walk. Uh, so generally what's recommended is uh, uh, when a patient is at a stage where the medication has been really helpful uh, for the symptoms, but perhaps now it's not quite enough to the point where we're thinking about stopping some hobbies, uh, perhaps stopping to work. So that's the time to consider DBS because what the studies have shown is that it's better to do it before you stop doing what you like or enjoy doing uh, because the DBS is more likely to be able to keep you within those activities, like doing what you want, what you enjoy doing. Uh, whereas if you wait until it stops, then it's very hard to reintroduce it even after the surgery. Uh, what it does, you know, uh, is to reduce the motor fluctuation, right? So a DBS is continuously on in the background. The medication is being administered. And so what we want is that good control phase on the left-hand side. Uh, and so what a DBS does is that it allows to act a little bit as an equalizer uh, to keep you in that phase. So the medication perhaps has less side effects because the dosage can be reduced and you're covered in between the dose of medication so you don't have as much of those off time. Uh, the studies have shown that basically most patients will, will gain approximately four to five hours of uh, useful time per day. Uh, the symptoms that are not improved with DBS are the ones like gait freezing, uh, swallowing difficulties, uh, balance issues, uh, and obviously cognitive problems. Uh, so what they describe as like the midline symptoms of, uh, of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and uh, you can see, so the, the goal of the therapy is to have people reintroduce uh, or maintain their hobbies. Uh, so a lot of people ask me what happens after the surgery, you know, what uh, are my limitations? The goal is to have you like maintain all your activities without restrictions. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we have people who went back uh, skiing or uh, surfing, you know, after the procedure. Um, when you go through the uh, TSA, you have a pocket card to show them so that they don't have you go through the metal detector as much as possible. Um, uh, but the idea is to live a normal uh, life, you know, after the procedure. Um, and maybe we can show this uh, uh, video briefly for uh, tremor reduction. You can click on both at the same time. Uh, so you can see on the left-hand side, uh, same patient, the same day, uh, in one case, the uh, DBS is off. Uh, in the other case, the DBS is on. So you can see like a um, uh, dramatic difference for the treatment of tremor. I'm dating it. I'm dating. And so a lot of people tell us that, you know, they, it's the first time that they've seen their handwriting in years, uh, you know, by the time they get the surgery. Uh, so I'll just stand in the uh, last two uh, minutes on the surgical technique and how we do the procedure. Um, we use a frameless uh, system. Uh, so if, if you've seen uh, YouTube videos or images on the internet, a lot of centers are using the large frame that you see on the right-hand side, which is a traditional way for performing the surgery. Uh, so we use a uh, custom-made uh, version uh, that's lighter and 3D printed that you can see on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, the two main advantages of that technique is that we can place both electrodes simultaneously during the surgery, and it's much lighter, uh, and the head is not fixated to uh, the surgical gurney. Uh, so that the surgery is more comfortable. Uh, and the way we proceed is we place uh, markers uh, typically about a week prior to the surgery. So it, it's an office procedure uh, done under uh, numbing medication. Uh, those markers, as you can see, we shave four small spots uh, on the head and then uh, the markers are a tiny screw of a few millimeters uh, that are embedded on the surface of the skull. Uh, so those are act, act as markers and the foundation for the main surgery. Uh, while you're at home, we plan the entire procedure using our computer system. 
So the green line here show the trajectory of the electrodes, uh, you know, entering the brain and, and sitting in the precise spots. Uh, so that's on the day of the surgery. So we receive uh, that 3D printed uh, mini frame uh, from the company based on the plan that we selected. As you can see, that mini frame has four legs and each leg is attached to one of the markers. So that's how it knows where it's located in space. Uh, so at that main surgery, an anesthesiologist uh, puts the patient to sleep, obviously, so that it's comfortable, there's no stress. Uh, then we uh, insert the electrodes in place. And uh, this uh, image shows that the head is not fixated to the bed. And that becomes important because once the electrodes are in place and we're not touching the head, we like to have the patient emerge from anesthesia so that we can check uh, the effect of the stimulation. Um, so we do a brief examination while the stimulation is on to see if there's any side effect and how the tremor and the other symptoms are improved. So it's nice not to have, obviously, the head fixated on the bed so that we, you know, the neck is more comfortable. Uh, the electrodes are secure in place once we're happy so that they're not uh, uh, moving around, uh, even if somebody, God forbid, was to have an accident. Um, and at the end of the procedure, uh, the electrodes are inserted typically towards the right side under the scalp. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Most patients go home the next morning. Uh, and they come back one week later where we place that small generator under the collarbone. And a lot of people ask me how we pass the wire without making a big scar. So like we have this, uh, what we call a tunneler, like this device that uh, goes under the skin to create a track. And that's how the wires are inserted. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, DBS uh, is a good option if people have uh, Parkinson's disease that has been responsive with uh, levodopa. But the medication may not be quite enough to keep you performing your hobbies or your job uh, and you're thinking about cutting down activities. Uh, you New York devices, you know, are bringing uh, advanced uh, uh, information to the providers and advanced, uh, advancing the technology both for the patients and the physicians. And through the surgical technique, you know, we made the surgery uh, simpler, uh, quicker, so that patients can recover faster and it's more comfortable during the procedure. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Langevin. Very interesting to see all of the advancements in um, the DBS um, devices, the actual devices over the years, and get a little peek into what the surgical procedure looks like. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're going to get ready to go into a, a 10 minute break, but before we do so, I just want to remind everybody, if you haven't seen it, you have pins in the, in the bags, the gift bags that are there for taking notes or to write on the question cards. So, um, if you did not have a pin already with you, just want to remind you that you have it there in the bag. Um, and so if you have any questions, again, um, on, write them on the question cards. If you need another question card, just raise your hand and someone will bring it to you. Um, and um, go ahead and leave your questions at the table or hold them up and someone will come and collect them. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and take the 10 minute break and be back at 11.05. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, um, Dr. Jesus Barreto Abrams, um, PhD. Dr. Barreto Abrams is a clinical neuropsychologist that evaluates patients in American Sign Language, Spanish or English. He mainly works with adults with cognitive concerns in the diagnosis and treatment of neurocognitive disorders due to neurological conditions such as dementia, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and other medical illnesses um, that have come along like the COVID-19 and cancer. He also specializes in working with deaf and hard of hearing children with neuropsychological concerns. Further, he serves as a neuropsychologist liaison to the cochlear implement, uh, implant team, assisting with candidacy evaluations. Dr. Barreto, welcome. Thank 
crew at Cheer. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Catrice, for the introduction. Um, thank you to Providence. Let me adjust this a little bit. Thank you to Providence, Little Company, and Mary, and the whole team who worked so hard to have this event today. Um, I'll be talking about mood and thinking abilities. This is a question that as a neuropsychologist, right, I often have to talk to patients and or families because Parkinson's disease, right, it doesn't only affect whomever has it. It's also a familial thing, right? There's a There may be caregiving, there may be adjustments in quality of life. That's really what I focus a lot of my time with the patient. <clears throat> One of the first things that I like to talk about, right, is who has feelings here and or thoughts, right? Everyone does, that, right? That's really the most important part. And one of the things that often comes along, right, or one of those changes that a lot of patients are concerned of is something like loss of motivation, right? Loss of motivation, like Dr. Diaz mentioned, um, is or can be termed apathy. Right. And it's really not wanting to do a lot of things, not feeling like you want to do a lot of things. And I'll talk briefly about some of the approaches, right, where we actually need to do something right in order to try to reduce that loss of motivation. Super counterintuitive, um, but it's actually how our brain, how our behaviors work. And this could also occur, right, that loss of motivation due to depression. It's called something a little bit different, anhedonia, but it's also very related. So emotional distress and depression could cause this, but also just something like a neurological condition. You may wonder, what is apathy? How do I know I may have it? And I have a couple questions that I want you to think of, right, or I want you to think about a family member or someone who you may know who may have some apathy. Am I interested in doing things? Just as simple as that, a yes or a no, right? Am I interested in new experiences? If we really think about our, right, 15 year old, 16 year old, 20 year old person, ourselves we're like, okay, we wanna do new things. And that's something that sometimes changes and it could be due to apathy. Is getting together with friends important? We are social creatures. That should be something important, right? And it could be due to apathy. And do I get excited about good news? That's an important part because good news usually makes us feel warm and fuzzy, it makes us feel good. And if that changes, that could be one of those reasons as well, right? So what is a behavioral approach to loss of motivation? First, think about what you like doing. What is pleasurable? what you like doing. Some people, a lot of patients say, I like going to the Redondo Beach Pier, right? Just sitting and enjoying myself. That's a great way to just schedule something that's pleasurable. Be active, actually think about things that you enjoy doing. Schedule your day to day, right? Early on in Parkinson's disease, right? When there might not be any cognitive dysfunction or changes at that point, when I mean cognitive, I mean by thinking abilities, um, Schedule your day. What is this going to be looking like? So that then these behavioral changes, right? These mood changes don't lead into not being able to do day-to-day -day things. And one of the reasons in this graph that you can see, right, is sort of how it feeds on each other, right? Not wanting to do the something could actually cause you not want to do even more things. And it sort of needs to be disruptive. We need to disrupt that cycle of not wanting to do things so that then we just get a little bit more motivation. Doesn't mean it's going to feel good, right? We can schedule something and still feel like we're not enjoying it as much, but at least we're doing it. And the scheduling of day-to-day -day things, right? It could be something as simple as I'm going to pay my bills. And a little bit later, I'll talk about how to break that apart into something that's simpler and feels doable. That's really an important part, doing things that feel doable. I always tell my patients, list three activities that you like doing, right? I like reading a magazine. I like playing with my grandchildren. I like watching a play. Find those things and schedule them, right? Write things that you feel like they're responsibilities. Do laundry, pay bills. Once again, it's about disrupting this, that loss of motivation. How do we do that? Well, we need to set a goal, right? And like Dr. Diaz and Dr. Langevin mentioned, quality of life is important. 
goal setting for exercise, right? We know that that's one of the most important lifestyle changes when it comes to Parkinson's disease is one of those things that it's important. It needs to be specific. I'm going to do, right, a resistant band five times today. That's specific. Five times is a specific number, right? I can measure it with a five time. Can I do it? I can't do five. I can only do two. Let's go back then and drop that down to two because it's measurable. It makes us want to do more tomorrow. Is it relevant to what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, my medical conditions? Yes. And do I have a time for this? In a week, I'm going to do two. In two weeks, I'm going to do five, et cetera. That's really about how we're setting these goals. And this doesn't only apply to something like loss of motivation. It could be other things, right? Like feeling a little bit nervous and trying to combat that as well, AKA like planning to go into surgery. There are also cognitive changes, right? Because of Parkinson's disease, not being able to navigate spaces as well, not because of motor issues, but because of actual brain-based cognitive thinking ability changes, right? There may also be changes in forgetting or forgetfulness. There may be changes in ability to plan out things and attentional changes as well. So my specialty is not about assessing these different things using a lot of different tests and a lot of different things that might look like paper or pencil, a little bit like school at times so that we can quantify and we can quantify it over time. The main difficulty that a lot of patients come in talking about it's executive functioning, right? Executive functioning, I call it the bus driver of your brain. It does a lot of different things. It helps you from storing memories, right? Being able to turn and learn all the way to pulling out memories um, and or things that you just learned. But one of those things that executive functioning does, right? It sort of blocks you from doing things. If a task seems daunting, like paying bills is one of those things that sometimes if they're not in auto pay, I like auto pay, it's easy, right? It sort of keeps everything going. But if we're actually doing, we need to be able to break it apart in simple steps, right? Do I have my funds? Can I log into my Bank of America account? Can I go into my account and pull those funds? Can I write out a check? Breaking apart in something that you could do check marks, right? Things that might seem having a visualized uh, checklist, right? Visualizing the task, knowing what you're doing. Some patients like doing things like setting up uh, furniture and stuff like that, right? Visualizing it before doing it and actually talking to yourself, right? Because nonverbal abilities or visual spatial difficulties could come across because of something like Parkinson's disease, talking to myself first, I'm going to do this and I'm going to put this together with that. And then just verbalizing what you're doing could be a strategy to help. Other things is having a home for commonly used things, always placing your keys in the same place, always, um, for example, knowing where the remote belongs. Those are things that actually sort of take apart that executive functioning, that sort of driver is not working so hard, right? It's actually just very smoothly driving other things in regards to your brain. Learning new names is something that a lot of patients tell me they have difficulties. Well, look at them in the eye and use their name. Hi, John, how are you, right? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating your name? Um, is it this or that? Is it spelled Anna with one N or two Ns, right? Um, do you have any children, Robin? Sort of using the name and doing it in different ways is a good way for you to actually be able to remember a name. So that's also a strategy that we often, right, as we do the assessment, as we understand what's going on, we may talk about after we're getting the results and we may refer out to different therapies, occupational therapy, speech language therapy, cognitive rehabilitation, so that you can get a little bit of compensatory strategies. That's really the important part how to navigate and have shortcuts to do different things that might feel daunting or might feel difficult, right? Whether it's because of behavioral difficulties or cognitive difficulties. And that's pretty much my time for today. I know it's a very brief introduction on sort of behavioral changes um, and cognitive changes because of Parkinson's disease, but I wanted everyone to have a little bit of exposure, a little bit of things that could be helpful, right? And if you have any questions, right, always talk to your um, physicians, always talk to your PCP if you have concerns for any memory difficulties, any changes in language or attention to see if an assessment will be warranted so that you can get a broad understanding of what might be occurring. Friday, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, right, well, there we go. Thank you.
Dr. Barreto. Um, so next, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexander Solomon. Dr. Alexander Solomon is a neuro-ophthalmologist and striabismus surgeon at Pacific Neuroscience Institute in Santa Monica and in Torrance. He believes in individualized patient care, emphasizing the importance of patient and family education and understanding in disease, diagnosis, and management. Dr. Solomon's expertise includes a visual field analysis, optical coherence tomography interpretation, and advanced adult striabismus. Um, oh, cray, wait, hold on, advanced adult cranial nerve palsies, and orbital disease. Dr. Solomon has presented his expertise in neuro-ophthalmology in local and, at local and national meetings and is a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. In 2022, he enthusiastically returned to the greater Los Angeles area and um, adopted his adopted home to serve communities, lucky for us, um, in the South Bay and Santa Monica once again. So Dr. Solomon, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning. Thanks to Robin and the Providence team for setting all of this up. I hope you guys are finding it helpful and I hope this talk also helps. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vision manifestations of Parkinson's disease. And some of these things are specific to Parkinson's, some of them are not. I don't have any financial disclosures, but let's talk a little bit about general health and, park it, and uh, vision. So vision is our most dominant sense. All of you are looking at my slides right now, so that's not a surprise to you. Um, but it's becoming integral to many of our daily activities, reading, writing, driving, but even more so as we are using more technology. So as we're becoming more dependent on our cell phones and emails, vision is playing a greater and greater role. Visual impairments associated with poor health, come, poor health outcomes in the general population, not just Parkinson's disease. It contributes to falls and injuries, depression and anxiety, as well as cognitive impairment and dementia. All of these things worsen if our vision is worse because we're getting less visual input into our nervous system. At least half of all the visual impairments out there is caused by eye diseases that are actually treatable or preventable. So it's really important that you continue to follow with your eye doctor, regardless of any Parkinson's disease. And this can be for things like refractive errors, aka the need for glasses or contacts, cataracts, glaucoma, or macular degeneration. What about vision in Parkinson's disease in particular? So vision is affected in Parkinson's disease. It can affect it in a number of different ways that we'll go over, but the experience as we've heard about Parkinson's disease in general is different for every individual patient. Parkinson's disease-related vision problems can negatively impact the quality of life, as we've discussed. However, it generally does not cause blindness, per se, so much as it causes problems or difficulty with vision. The good news, a lot of these symptoms are treatable, but typically it's not through the same things that Dr. Diaz does of adjusting Parkinson's disease medications. Sometimes it's taking a more individualized approach to adjusting glasses prescriptions, eye drops, or lifestyle modifications. So if you've developed a new problem with your vision, it can be really difficult to tell. Is this a problem from Parkinson's disease or is this another type of problem like glasses or cataracts? Because vision symptoms are really hard to put into words sometimes. A lot of times it just comes out as I'm having difficulty seeing. So it's really important for your doctor to help distinguish between what's a problem from Parkinson's disease and what might be another type of eye problem. So, some common problems in Parkinson's disease in particular, dry eye, by far and away the most common problem, I would say in all adults, but particularly problematic in uh, Parkinson's disease patients we'll talk about in just a sec. Uh, double vision is a common issue, as are more sort of generic things such as difficulty reading, impaired depth perception, and something more particular to Parkinson's disease are visual hallucinations, and we'll talk a little bit about all these things and some of their treatments in just a second. So dry eye, a silly question, why do we blink? And now everyone's thinking about the fact that they're blinking as I say this. And it's actually to spread the tear film across the surface of our eye, which uh, is really important for keeping our acuity good and the surface of our eye moist and healthy. 
people with Parkinson's disease have a decreased blink rate, and this is variable about how much it's decreased, but makes them more prone to developing this dryness. Some Parkinson's disease medications, like amantadine, can actually worsen this tendency towards dryness. And you can also develop a typical age-related irritation of the eyelids called blepharitis from meibomian gland dysfunction, but that can contribute as well. So what can we do? You could try to blink more often, easier said than done. Um, and the blink rate naturally decreases as we're doing things with visual activity, like screen or reading time. So taking a break from those things is one thing that we can do every once in a while as we're doing them. The mainstay of dry eye treatment is artificial tears. These are available over the counter. We don't like things that say anti-redness or get the red out because it hides the problem without actually helping it. But they have both daytime uh, liquid preparations and nighttime gels or ointments. And you can use them up to four to six times a day or more frequently if they're preservative free. It's easy to forget to, have, to use them once you have them, unfortunately. So some things that I tell my patients to do is to time them with meals or with other medications like your covert dopa, levodopa. Um, some examples for brand names, Refresh, Siste, and Gentile. I used to not list these, but unfortunately, you might have seen in the news recently, some artificial tears have not been uh, properly vetted and have had to be recalled recently. Let's talk about double vision a little bit. So it can occur for two reasons. Number one, there's a problem with the individual eye. If you cover up an eye and you still have double vision, this might mean you need something like a glasses treatment or a cataract surgery, or you might need to have your retina assessed. But the important thing is that's not a neurologic problem and not specific to Parkinson's disease. If you can cover up either eye and that double vision goes away, that double vision is being caused because the eyes are pointing in different directions, like two cameras. And if you turn off one of those cameras, it turns off the second image. That's called strabismus, and it can be neurologic and etiology. This affects up to 30% of patients with Parkinson's disease, and the most common pattern is that the patient will have double vision at near, but not at distance. In particular, this is called convergence insufficiency, and it's a problem with the triangulation that your eyes have to do in order to look at something up close. And it can emerge or worsen with any intracranial injury or surgery, including deep brain stimulation sometimes. What's the treatment for this? So, the most simple one is an occlusion, which is covering an eye, either closing it naturally or using a patch. You can use prism glasses, which bend the light and move the location of the image without necessarily moving the location of the eye. Or in some cases, we do a surgery, which is something I do as a surgical neuro-ophthalmologist, which is tightening or weakening the muscles of the eye in order to help realign the eyes and reset their neutral position so that they're more aligned. Eye muscle exercises don't often help, except for convergence insufficiency, which is important because that's the most common version in Parkinson's disease. Um, difficulty reading. Reading is a really complex, demanding task. It requires both good vision and good processing of what things are being seen, and it requires rapid eye movements, which unfortunately tend to be affected in Parkinson's disease. Anything that affects vision, including uh, dry eye, double vision Parkinson's disease, can disproportionately affect reading. And everyone needs an alteration in their reading prescription after the age of 40 due to a change in our lenses and their flexibility. Other neurologic diseases can impact comprehension, as we mentioned. So it's not just what you see, it's how you process what you see. A lot of people use bifocals or progressive lenses in order to have uh, all their prescription in one. But unfortunately, bifocals and progressives can be problematic in Parkinson's disease. And that's because, as I mentioned, the quick eye movements uh, that are required to accurately and easily use these types of glasses can become a little bit more limited in Parkinson's disease. So one simple thing that we can do is separate our distance and near glasses in order to try to decrease the reliance on those saccades and increase the windows where we have good vision I'll move on to depth perception, uh, which is the ability to perceive three-dimensional space using two two-dimensional images that are being produced by your eyes. This can be affected in Parkinson's disease for a variety of reasons. It requires good vision in each eye. Dry eye can affect that. It requires the eyes to be pointed in generally the same direction and same target, so the double vision can affect that. And again, your brain has to actually process and put together those two-dimensional images to form that three-dimensional field, which can be affected for a variety of reasons. Driving is a very common issue, especially in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a complex task, requires a number of modalities, and vision is obviously an important one, but you also need attention, coordination, and reaction time. So Parkinson's disease-related visual symptoms can affect driving. 
And the effects of driving, those effects on driving can usually be mitigated with caution as we improve those visual aspects of Parkinson's. But unfortunately, many patients with Parkinson's do eventually have to stop driving at some point. It's usually not their vision that stops them though. And the vision requirements really vary by state. Um, to drive this point home, you might see some of these cars wandering around that have a variety of cameras and actually have better vision than any human can, but they don't quite have the processing ability yet to be able to drive themselves uh, safely. So the last thing I'll talk about is visual hallucinations, uh, which is simply seeing something that isn't there. This is actually a really common symptom in Parkinson's disease, but frequently underreported because patients worry about telling someone about seeing things that they don't think are there because they don't want to appear crazy. They don't want to appear like they have dementia, but it is a direct manifestation of Parkinson's disease and can appear or worsen with certain medications. It can be a wide range of symptoms, including the illusion or presence of movement uh, in the peripheral vision. Some people will just see unusual shadows. Some people will actually see formed objects like animals or people or children. And it can be really distressing or threatening in some cases where they feel like there's someone trying to break into the house or things like that. And it's important to mention because uh, adjusting the Parkinson's disease medications or adding specific medications for hallucinations are options for patients who are experiencing these things. The last thing I'll mention briefly, there, is, uh, there are studies showing that color vision decreases in Parkinson's disease, but really it's largely asymptomatic when this happens. But if you can't see the number hidden in this uh, Ishihara color plate, it might be worth talking to your eye doctor about it. So what does a neuro-ophthalmologist do? We do double vision assessments, as I mentioned. Uh, we do visual pathway assessments looking at how those eye-brain connections are working. And we sort of take into account the entire person and how their visual processing is going. In summary, we look at the neurologic impact on, the, uh, on vision in the eyes. I want to thank my colleagues, including Dr. Diaz, uh, and uh, one of my mentors who helped me put together the slide set. And I want to thank all of you for coming out again. All right. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Um, very interesting to just have a walkthrough of all those common visual symptoms that we see and um, or can see in Parkinson's disease patients. So thank you for sharing that. So we're coming very close to a close, but um, we have our last speaker for today. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carol Park. Carol Park is a specialized speech language pathologist at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Carol has expertise in evaluating and treating voice, speech, language, and swallowing disorders related to head and neck cancers, um, vocal fold issues, and neurological swallowing um, disorders related to head and neck cancers. Um, in addition to conditions like stroke um, and Parkinson's disease, she excels in video fluoroscopic fluoroscopic swallow studies, fiber optic endoscopic evaluations of swallow, and comprehensive speech language assessments, offering personalized and evidence-based treatments. Carol is certified in Lee Silverman voice treatment and has previously worked with the laryngectomy patients and individuals using tracheoesophageal prostheses. Carol is committed to improving patients' lives through her multifaceted career. Welcome, Carol. All right, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the gratitude for all of you coming out today, um, as well as the staff of Providence Little Company of Mary and Pacific Neuroscience Institute. I also want to thank Dr. Diaz and the team for um, including Allied Health today. So we really appreciate that as well. Um, so, you know, when we talk about swallowing and speech and Parkinson's, I'm going to start off by actually talking about swallowing. Um, and let's see if I can get this to work here. 
So when it comes to swallowing, it's not something that we typically think about. So eating and drinking usually involves, you know, we, we have to do it for sustenance and we also have to do it for joy and comfort, right? So all of you today have had the joy and comfort of maybe having the snacks that were provided as well. Um, but when we think about the actual process of swallowing, it's very complicated. Um, and it's something that researchers are, are trying to understand, you know, the, the true nuts and bolts of how it is that we swallow. And when we swallow, it takes, you know, under a second for everything to happen. Um, and for everything to happen, we have to think about safety, uh, safety and efficiency when it comes to swallowing. So swallowing safety and swallowing efficiency. Um, but like I said, it's very complicated, but it, it, um, it involves maybe over 25 pairs of muscles bilaterally, and it's all about timing and coordination uh, in order for us to, again, have a safe and efficient swallow. So the essential things that we need are uh, intact sensation, right, in order to actually even enjoy uh, a meal. Uh, we also need good muscle strength. Um, and we also need good timing and coordination. So if I were to pare it down to fully understand, well, or at least simply understand what swallowing entails, it entails brain function, good brain function, and good muscle strength. So these are just images, right, of, of the mouth and the throat, and you can tell that it's very intricate, right? So even uh, if you're looking at me right now, the, the layers of muscles that, um, that are covered inside the skin, there's a lot going on. And a lot of those muscles have to be triggered when it comes to swallowing. Um, so this is a video of uh, a typical swallow study that, that we do as speech pathologists. And this might be something your neurologist or your doctor might recommend. So this is what we call a video fluoroscopic swallow study. So in, in this video, um, it presents a, a patient with a, a normal swallow function. And I'm just going to go into detail a little bit about what we just saw here. So I talked about swallow safety and swallow efficiency. So what do I mean by swallow safety? It's essentially we don't want any food or liquid entering the airway, right? So we don't want to choke on anything. Um, so if I were to kind of fully look at what, I, what, what we mean by that, um, the airway is in red here, right? That's the trachea. And then in the back is the esophagus. So um, if just in, in, again, paring it down, you have the airway in the front of the throat and in the back is the esophagus. So obviously we want all the food and liquid to go into the esophagus and not the airway. And then when it comes to swallow efficiency, we want to make sure nothing remains in the throat after we eat or drink. So if we take a look at this image, we don't want anything um, in the throat after we take that initial swallow. It might take us a couple of swallows to get things down, but typically it should be nice and, and clear. So here you'll see that um, there's a problem, right? So um, in the airway, what do we see? We see food or liquid in the airway, which is something we obviously don't want. And then there's also a little bit in the esophagus. And then when it comes to swallow efficiency, this patient here after they have uh, initially swallowed, we see um, some remaining material. So these are things that we want to look out for when it comes to someone who might have some swallowing issues. So what happens to uh, patients who might present with Parkinson's and they're swallowing? Uh, so, you know, again, to make it simple, we're seeing a dysfunction when it comes to coordination, movement, um, and sensation. And then there might be changes uh, in the muscles themselves. We might see some weakening of the muscles. So it kind of all relates to, to movement, right? So as Dr. Diaz was saying, the bradykinesia, the dyskinesia, um, the rigidity, these are all aligned. Um, so it's no different from maybe physical movement and the movements that, are, uh, that you need for, for your throat or for your swallowing to happen, again, safely and efficiently. So these are just common signs of things to look out for. So if you're noticing um, a lot of coughing or throat clearing during meals, um, if you sound a little wet or gurgly and you can't clear that out, um, if you're having recurrent issues related to pneumonia, um, these are all maybe reasons to, or symptoms to talk about with your doctor, or if you have a speech pathologist to talk uh, to him or her about that. And so, you know, the biggest concern of course is that um, 
the aspiration or food or liquid entering the airway can um, cause serious consequences, right? So um, anything into the airway is something we don't want, and that can cause an infection. Uh, it can also cause aspiration pneumonia, respiratory distress, and, and uh, you know, it kind of spirals down from there. Um, so uh, this is a video here of someone who is swallowing, and you can see um, how impaired this patient is presenting, and I wonder if we could run that one. Hopefully it'll run here. Maybe not. There we go. So things are coming down, and you'll see that nothing really enters the esophagus. So, so this is a really severe case, but kind of just gives you, again, an idea of well, all that material going into the airway and the person is aspirating. Um, and so how can we help? We talk about swallow strategies, uh, and then we talk about diet modifications. I'm not going to go through these in detail because I'm a little limited in timing, um, but we also talk about swallow exercises. There are three things that we as speech pathologists uh, like to do to help uh, in a case where a patient might present with some issues with swallowing. And then to transition into speech and voicing. So, I mean, we're dealing with the same areas, right? The mouth and the throat, but uh, obviously the, the, the function is different. Um, but um, in terms of what's involved, again, it's the brain and, and the muscles, okay? So we need good function of, 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 of both of those things. And so when it comes to voice and, and speech, you know, the, the way I'm talking to you right now is because I'm actually taking really good breaths with my lungs, right? So we need to incorporate good breathing when we're speaking. We also need to in, uh, incorporate uh, the voice box, right? So the reason why you're hearing the sounds is because of the movements that are happening in my voice box. And this is just another video here to show you. These are vocal cords here. And, and because of that good breath coming from the lungs, it's moving the vocal folds. And this is happening um, hundreds of times per second. Um, and then finally, when it comes to, to speech, we also have to make sure we move the, our mouths and uh, our lips, our tongue. Uh, the throat has to kind of shape, be shaped in a particular way to make the sounds that we do. And this is a video of, of an MRI, and we'll go ahead and play it. Um, what the patient is saying is, welcome to the uh, science gallery of the Max Planck Gallery. And so the idea behind this is that there's so much movement involved, right? So when it comes to Parkinson's, what we're seeing is, again, some impairments in those three areas. So we see impairments with lung function. We might see decreased breath support and lung volumes. Uh, we might see some rigidity in the vocal, sorry, the, vo the vocal folds, um, uh, so weakness as well. And then there's also some weakness when it comes to the vocal tracts of so the lips, the tongue, um, that could all be impacted as well. Uh, so you, how, that, how might that manifest? That might manifest through reduced loudness, a vocal tremor, a, a breathy, hoarse voice, a reduced pitch and kind of a monotone voice. Um, reduced enunciation as well, along with hesitations and stuttering, and sometimes an increased rate of speech. Um, so again, how can someone uh, like me or a speech pathologist in general help? We can uh, incorporate some exercises for lung function. Um, we can also incorporate some warm-ups for your vocal folds and your vocal cords. Also include some exercises as well and then some exercises and strategies to improve the vocal, vocal tract. So again, like lip movements, tongue movements, tongue strengthening, et cetera. Um, and as Catrice mentioned, I'm uh, certified in the Lee Silverman Voice Treatment Program. So there are different programs out there that require certification for a speech pathologists to, to incorporate into practice. Um, and, and what's nice about these programs is that they are very evidence-based, but they do require a, a ton of commitment. So it's like um, the LSVT program requires uh, meeting four days a week uh, for a month um, to, to incorporate that into practice. And then finally, you know, in terms of effectiveness of speech therapy, um, it's not like school, right? So you're not forced to come unless your spouse or your family member is forcing you to come. Um, but it really, you know, I think for me, the most meaningful thing when it comes to working with patients is, is doing things that are interesting to you, right, and functional. So what is it that you want to do? What is your goal? 
in 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 speech therapy. Um, so I always like to talk about that with my patients, and I think that makes it more rewarding. And then I think there's a reciprocity there; it makes it more interesting and enjoyable as well. So, you know, hopefully there isn't reluctance, right? If anything, we're here to help you guys. Um, so, um, yeah, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for that interesting presentation, sharing with us, um, you know, just the swallowing, the sw you know, things to look out for with swallowing difficulties and and a speech, as well as exercises and things that can be done to help. Um, but we're going to get ready to go into our Q and A session. But before we do, I just want to take a minute. And just um, you know, thank the panel here of experts. We're just very lucky to have this expertise from PNI and Providence in the South Bay. So thank you all to all of your speakers for spending your Saturday morning with us. Um, so um, I know we have. If we do have any question cards um, completed for the afternoon, just hold them up and we'll have someone come and pick them up from you. So Robin is there in the back. Um, she'll get those cards. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead and get started on some of the questions that we collected from the morning. So Dr. Langevin just handed me a card, so I'm gonna take this one. Um, so um, is there an age limit for DBS implantation? So somebody must have given him this card. Dr. Langevin? Uh, yeah, the short answer, is this connected or? Uh, the short answer is that there's no age limit. Um, what we consider for the surgery is mostly uh, medical conditions. Uh, so we, we've had patients like into their 90s, you know, referred for uh, DBS. Um, so it's mostly things like uh, the heart status uh, and uh, if you're using like blood thinners, so those are issues that can increase your risk with surgery. Um, but typically it's mostly like a medical optimization where we work with the primary care provider to make sure that conditions like diabetes, blood pressures are under control to, to uh, reduce the risk of surgery. All right, thank you. So um, this question here, is it, a good idea to do a DAT scan to monitor progress of um, mild memory or cognitive issues. So I'll answer that one. So um, that's potent. Um, so a DAT scan is not for cognitive issues. So a DAT scan is more for the physical symptoms of, as I mentioned, tremor, stiffness, slowness. If we're trying to decide if somebody truly has Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like condition as opposed to another form of tremor or another condition that can look like Parkinson's physically, the DAT scan helps with that. So somebody, as I mentioned, with Parkinson's has low dopamine-producing cells. We'll see that on the DAT scan where somebody that doesn't have Parkinson's or one of the Parkinson's conditions, that will be normal. Common scenario is, you know, somebody like essential tremor, or let's suppose somebody's on some medications that make them look like Parkinson's disease, but they don't have Parkinson's disease. That would be a good one to do for that. We don't follow the DAT scan over time. It has not been good at sort of staging or following the progression, and that's because they're, you know, there's a lot of other intrinsic factors in people that, that can change the progression of their Parkinson's disease. So we don't use the DAT scan. It's really just more for diagnosis, but not for progression of the condition. Great, Great. thank you. This question is related to um, obsessive compulsive disorder problems. Um, and is there any type of connection between like an OCD disorder such as hoarding um, and movement disorders, um, any correlation there? Well, maybe we'll both approach it. Um, yes, there can be with Parkinson's disease, and it can also be 
a known side effect of some of the medications, right? So some of the dopamine-based medications, dopamine is a reward chemical, right? We release dopamine naturally whenever we feel good or have a reward for stuff. So some people are a little bit more sensitive to some of our dopamine-based medications and can bring out or flourish some compulsive tendencies. So if people are experiencing that, it's important to speak to your neurologist because it may be an adjustment of medications, or sometimes there are some medications to help with that. DBS can sometimes also make that a little bit worse, too. So it is always important for your neurologist to know. From a psychiatric standpoint, right, OCD is a, is a category, right, and a diagnosis in it of itself. Um, it's about really the compulsive uh, and the obsessive thinking of things. Um, like Dr. Diaz mentioned, right, some of these traits and or behaviors could be related due to Parkinson's disease, could be related, right, to, to medication. But when it comes to OCD in and of itself, right, we see it in standalone sort of um, diagnoses more, more than anything else. Um, so that's the important part. Usually OCD comes right early on, it doesn't come with a neurological condition. Um, so we always have to assess what is occurring, right? So for example, I know that um, in Parkinson's disease, we see impulsivity, we see people thinking about certain things sometimes, right? Um, some patients might wanna gamble a little bit more, right? And they're sort of like obsessing about that, but that's more an impulsivity, neurobehavioral sort of um, symptom, more so than OCD, it's more about, right? I can't control things. It could be because of, for example, germs. It could be a little bit about wanting to um, do things, having everything in even spaces or having the volume in the car at two and four and six. So it's a little bit different. And I know that for both, right, like Dr. Langevin mentioned, um, DBS could be sort of an approach to treatment as well. But I would recommend, right, a psychiatric evaluation and a neurological con uh, evaluation. Those are sort of different depending on age, onset, one of those things that's important, and whether or no motor symptoms are present, right, that could sort of help differentiate. Thank you. So this is um, a, a little bit of a two-part, sort of. Um, so is it better to delay treatment for Parkinson's or essential tremor? Like, is there some sort of downside if you delay? Part one. And then the other part is, what is the prognosis for somebody with Parkinson's? Meaning, does it affect the lifespan? OK. So um, first, I'll talk about prognosis. As I mentioned, you know, we think about Parkinson's in the long run. I think of it as a marathon. We talk about it as being a decades-long condition, right, with a slow progression over time. But we have learned, as I mentioned, there's a lot of things that people can do on their own, staying healthy, staying active, working with your physicians, getting good sleep, socializing. All the things that are good for our brain in general help us compensate better with any neurological condition we come across in our lifestyle, right, in our time. So doing all those healthy things helps lower the progression of Parkinson's, right? In terms of medication, no. There's this myth out there, um, and you always have to be careful when you go on to Dr. Google and what you read about Parkinson's and the medications. Um, we, we never promote delaying medications. We always say medications are there to help support. They're there to treat the symptoms so that people can keep doing what they need to do. Now, sometimes people come to me and their symptoms are very mild. We don't need to start medications. They're still golfing. They're still working. They're still doing their life. They may have a little bit of an annoying tremor, but um, they're like, uh, you know, I can deal with it so that we don't start medicine. What we don't like to see is people that are coming in and they're giving up work, they're giving up time with their family, they're giving up time to go out and socialize and do their hobbies because they're fearful of the medication. And then there's this other myth out there with levodopa, our classic medicine. If I started too early, that means I'm gonna lose effectiveness. The problem that people can have with levodopa is not the levodopa itself. The levodopa is there to get your brain to make more dopamine. And it is dependent on people having enough of that machinery in the brain.
to turn it into dopamine. So the loss of effectiveness of levodopa has to do more with the internal factor rather than the medication itself. So knowing that it doesn't really matter when you start the medicine. You want to start it, these medicines at a point where you're like, I can't get out to see my kids or my grandkids because I'm you know, stiff and I'm slow, or I may have to give up work because my tremor is getting in the way. That's when we want to talk to medicine. And we just want to be judicious with the medicine and not go crazy, but use it so we can keep you moving and doing the things you want to do. So these questions are sort of related to the, um, uh, you know, the, the gut connection and so one is about you know emerging technologies and if if there is any um, technology available that would study the um, gut micro um, biome and if if there's any way to kind of tailor your diet to you know prevent progression um, the other the other question sort of relates is if you do stop that progression would it then stop the PD disease per progression? Interesting questions. And we're still just at the forefront of understanding all these little factors, right? We, we do know that the gut is very involved. Um, you know, technology-wise, like all things, technology is, is going to be at the forefront of a lot of these things. We, we still don't have great technology for understanding what's happening in the gut. I, I recommend that if somebody's having a lot of gastrointestinal sy symptoms, talk to your doctors, neurologists, sometimes get a referral to a gastroenterologist. They can assess people for what we call small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, I would not spend a ton of money on supplements and probiotics unless you're working with somebody that is like a naturopath that understands where they're sourcing these things. Sometimes people will look at stool soft st samples and try to understand the type of bacteria that you have because, you know, there, there's, we have a lot of good bacteria that's in there and we have some bad bacteria and it's a balance that we try to keep. So all I can say for right now is trying to eat as healthy as you can to promote your own good bacteria. Um, you know, to, to take over and, and be healthy. And if you're having a lot of intestinal symptoms, talk to your doctor. Because part of it is if you're very constipated, you're giving that bad bacteria time to kind of get in there and, and, and be naughty. Um, if sometimes the diet that you're eating might be letting that bad bacteria get bad, sometimes people have other gastrointestinal symptoms or, or other conditions that can also be at play as well, and we need to sort that out before we blame it on the Parkinson's. So just try to eat some of these you know, very healthy diets so that your natural bacteria flourishes, and then talk to your doctors if you're having a lot of gastrointestinal <laughs> symptoms so we can help. All right, so my next set of questions are related to the DBS uh, surgery. And um, one is if you can speak to the risk associated with a surgery such as infection, or is it considered one of those high risk surgeries? And what is the rate of success for essential tremors? These are great, great questions. So the, the risk of the surgery, uh, as it's mentioned, infection is one of the things we're con uh, concerned about. Uh, the risk there is about 3%. Um, and uh, we, we cut down the risk by using antibiotics at the time of the procedure uh, through the veins. Uh, and also, we typically place powder of antibiotics around the device. And that's cut down the risk to about like 1% or 2%. <laughs> Uh, so it's still not eliminated completely, but uh, significantly reduced. Um, other things we're concerned about is any type of bleeding on the surface of the brain or along the trajectory of the electrode. Um, and so that's where we limit the risk by uh, planning our trajectory, obviously, away from critical areas uh, and controlling the blood pressure during the procedure. Overall, the risk of that is about 1%, uh, of which half the patient will experience long-term uh, side effects. So the, the, essentially the risk of having a neurological or brain issue after the procedure is about 0.5%. Uh, 
So in the realm of a neurosurgery, it's considered a low risk procedure. Uh, some people in the field have, con have considered even doing it as an outpatient, uh, you know, as uh, ambulatory surgery cen centers emerge. So we're not there yet, but it's consideration. Um, sorry, the, the other question was about uh, the... Uh, Rate of success. Yes. For uh, essential tremor. So essentially, ev everyone with uh, essential tremor who undergoes a surgery has a uh, significant benefit for tremor. Uh, the real question is how much of the tremor is controlled? Um, and so typically, so it's never 100%, so very rare that you know, someone would have like no tremor once the device has started. In general, what we see is the majority of patients will have about 80, 85% control. Uh, so that becomes meaningful like with, uh, high, with a task that requires a high level of precision. So, you know, things like uh, uh, we've had patients doing, uh, making jewelry um, and knitting, uh, uh, it, applying uh, mascara, like things where it requires uh, more uh, dexterity. And so that's where the patient programmer becomes useful because uh, with the current technology, you can select different programs. So certain programs will give you like a higher level of energy and control of your tremor, but it's going to come at a cost of some side effects, like it could be uh, speech slurring. Uh, so issues where like the surrounding areas of the brain are encroach with the stimulation. And so then the patient can toggle from one program to another. So if they don't need to speak, for example, but they're performing a hobby that requires a high level of dexterity, they can switch to one program and then uh, vice versa, when they're doing daily activities, they can go back to a regular mode. So I'd say that uh, virtually everyone has significant benefits. I, I personally haven't had anybody requesting the device removed or turned off. Uh, so it's more of a question of like, what, to what degree your tremor is gonna be controlled. Thank you. So we're running out of, out of time, and I've got a lot of really great questions. We're going to do just a couple more questions, and then we're going to have to close for, for the afternoon. But um, I'm going to continue. This question is related to um, essential tremor, tremor. So if I have essential tremor, um, is it likely that it will progress to Parkinson's? So no. Um, tremor, Essential tremor and Parkinson's are essentially two separate conditions, although both can exist in a family, both can exist in the same person, right? So essential tremor is a different condition, it can be diagnosed in any age. I have lots of patients that have had tremor that can tell me, even when I was a child, I was a little tremulous, and over the years, maybe it's gotten a little bit worse. Some people stay at a decent level and they have annoying tremor, but they're still able to do all their activities. And some patients, that tremor progresses over time and starts to interfere with their activity. Now, as we get older, all of us in this room, everybody, is at risk for developing Parkinson's. Age is the most common risk factor for Parkinson's. So it's not uncommon for people can get both. I've had tremor all my life since I was a kid, but now I've gotten Parkinson's disease. So people can have both. But one doesn't necessarily increase the risk for the other. Great, great. So I am being told I have time for one more question. I wish I could read them all. There are a lot of really good questions here. But um, okay, so this one is that uh, Providence and PNI has many neurologists, as we see here and as we've shared with you in our packet and things. How do you all coordinate care? Right. So I mean. First and foremost, I am a neurologist, right? So I'm, I, I've just taken in a little bit of extra training in Parkinson's, and we have a lot of great neurologists in this community, a lot of great neurologists at, at Providence. So, you know, I have lots of friends that are general neurologists that are really good at diagnosing and starting Parkinson's treatment. We coordinate when that neurologist feels that they're kind of getting into, you know, you, you saw the list of medications that I put on there and, and deep brain stimulation for some patients. Like a lot of neurological com conditions, the treatment is getting complicated and our choices that we have available for treating people is getting complicated. And so, you know, many times my general neurologist friends, you know, they'll begin the treatment, but then all of a sudden they're like, okay, 
now where do I go? And so then I may get a referral um, from my general neurologist. Sometimes I'll get it directly from the primary care physicians. Um, if you feel that you want to have a little bit more information from, from a movement disorder specialist, you know, you can always ask your neurologist. I think most physicians have a thick enough skin and have enough clientele that if you feel like you want to see a subspecialist and ask them for a consultation, most will, will, will give you one. But generally, we work together with the other, the, the neurologists, the primary care doctors, and, and other physicians to offer another level of support and consultation, especially as the time goes on, you know, Parkinson's treatment can get a little complicated. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. And that concludes our questions for the afternoon. Um, thank you all for taking time to attend the presentation today. A big thank you to all of our presenters, again, for taking time to provide us with all of this valuable information. We, uh, as Providence, will be sending out a recording of the presentation to all attendees for you to view. Um, we'll also be posting this on Facebook on the Providence um, Little Company of Mary social media page. For any additional information or to schedule an appointment, call our Patient Engagement Center, 1-888-HEALING, H-E-A-L-I-N-G. And thank you and have a great rest of your day.